Hello friends, myself Neha Gupta, your mentor for current affairs. So today we are going to discuss about the global trade outlook. So what is this, which organization has released it and what does it say about India? All of this we will be discussing in our very first question. Apart from this, we will also be looking at the other questions that can come in your upcoming RBI or SEBI examinations. Okay. So let's begin this video but before that if you haven't subscribed our channel then you can subscribe and also you can join the telegram group which uh, where you will get the pdf of this session and the link of this group is in description below. So guys this is our first question how much would India contribute to the global trade global import sector by 2050 as per the global trade outlook 2021 report of UK. So guys here you need to keep this thing in your mind that there are two global trade outlooks basically there are two reports with the same name global trade outlook by UNCTAD that is United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. So it also has a global trade outlook and this global trade outlook report has been released by uk therefore it is also named as uk global trade outlook so this is one distinction that you have to memorize now let's move on to this question so how much would india contribute in the global import sector in the global import market in simple terms this question is asking what would be india's share in global imports so as per this report india's share would be 5.9 percent option a is the right answer so now let's go into the details of this report because those are important for your exam so the very first thing is that department of international trade of united kingdom has released this report the next point is that this report projects that india will become the third largest importer in the world by 2050 and the share of imports in the global imports that India would hold is 5.9%. Okay, so this would be the share that India will be having in the global import market by 2050 and the countries which will precede India are China and US. So China would be the largest importer by replacing US. Okay. Next point is at present India is ranked 8th in terms of imports and the share of imports is 2.8%. So from 2.8% in 30 years we will reach to 5.9% of the share of the total uh, share in the global imports market next point is that by 2050 india will become the third largest economy just behind china and the us with a share of 6.8 percent of the global gdp at present india is ranked fifth in size of the world economies with a share of 3.3 percent now guys here many percentages are given here you have to memorize each and every percentage with the concern with the context for example this 4.9 percent share is the projected share in the global import market whereas this 6.8 percent is the projected share in the global gdp okay so india's contribution in the global gdp in the global income would be 6.8 percent in the year 2050 and thus India would become the third largest economy and at present India's share is 3.3 percent in terms of GDP in the world and India stands at the fifth position. Next is India is projected to replace Germany as the fourth largest economy in the year 2030 only. So these were the facts about India. Now let's have a look at the global scenario. So US and EUs. Now here we are talking about the collective group of 27 nations which are developed. So US and European Union's overall imports are projected to decline by 2030 due to the rising purchasing power parity in the Indo-Pacific region. Okay, so I will come to this point later on but let's first have a look at the other points. Okay. 56% of the global growth in imports 
is expected to come from the Indo-Pacific region as compared to a quarter from uh, European Union and North Com America combined during 2019 to 2050. So what this point is saying that in terms of imports, global imports, 56% of the share will be uh, will be hold will be held by the Indo-Pacific countries. Now, Indo-Pacific region includes two major economies, China and India. Okay. So 56% of the imports will be uh, going to this Indo-Pacific region only by the year 2050, which also denotes the rise in the purchasing power parity, the rise in the consumption levels, the rise in the living of standard of the people residing in the Indo-Pacific region. Therefore, this report you must have come across or until now you must have uh, realized this thing that the tone of this report is positive. It is taking the imports in a positive light. Why is it doing so? Because here the imports are considered as an indicator of consumption, as an indicator of standard of living, as an indicator of increase in the consumption, in the demand, in the purchasing power parity and in the socio-economic scenario of the Indo-Pacific region. That is why India is projected as the third largest global importer by 2050 and it is a good point for India as well because purchase or import tabhi karte hai jab income zyada hoti hai. Okay, so in this slide, this statement is important. I hope that now you have understood this, uh, this statement well. Next is China is the major driver of this shift from west to east because China is the major economy at present in the Indo-Pacific region and if we compare it with the global scenario then it is the second most powerful economy of the world. Okay, so this shift in imports, where, when there was a time when the Western countries, US plus European Union, okay, so 27 developed countries from Europe plus US, so these were the major economies. So there was one time that the majority of imports were going or were consumed by these countries, by these segments, by the West, but now this shift is coming majorly driven by China. Okay, and India, China and India. China is expected to replace US in the purchasing power parity by 2030. So this is obvious. By 2030, both US and China will account for 22% of the global GDP. Now, the very interesting and important point that this report highlights is the E7 group. So E7 group is the group of seven largest economies emerging economies which include China, India, Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, Mexico, Turkey. So four of the BRICS nations are there except from the South Africa. So South Africa is not there but China, India, Russia and Brazil apart from those four Indonesia, Mexico and Turkey. So these are the seven largest emerging economies. Do remember which countries are in the E7 grouping. Now, what does this report say about this group? This report says that the import of the E7 groups, the import by these uh, countries will match the imports by the G7 group. Now, we know that G7 is a grouping of developed countries where Canada, US, UK, France, Germany, Italy, Japan. So these are the seven countries which in which are a part of G7. So all of them are very developed countries. So what this report is saying by 2050, these emerging economies will come to the level of the G7 economies in terms of imports. Remember in terms of imports we are talking about. So I hope that you have understood this report well. And this is the chart. This is the picture. And these rankings are given on the basis of imports. Okay, so as you can see that presently India is at the 8th position, in 2030 we will be at the 4th position and by 2050 India will come at the, 20, uh, at the 3rd position. So this is the chart and guys I am again saying do memorize the percentages because that are important. Moving on to the next question, which state has declared cattle as the, as its state fish so you must have 
come across the navad grade analysis as well snow leopard is the state animal of which state or union territory that was a question in your navad grade evening shift okay so state animals state fishes particularly those which are in the news are important so sikkim has recently announced that catle will be its state fish so the right answer here is option a sikkim now let's know something about the fish as well as other state emblems other state icons of sikkim the very first thing is that this is also known as copper mahseer so this is the name of this fish and the scientific name of this fish is this you don't have to memorize this long name nobody is going to ask you the scientific name of this fish but it was just for your information but yes this name is important you should know that copper mahseer is the name of this catle fish and it is the state animal state fish of sikkim so this is a very general point that in 2014 this fish was declared as endangered by the iucn from here my question for you guys is where is the headquarters of iucn mention it in the comment section below and in this step the reservoirs for this catle fish which are located in sikkim are mentioned so these are located at these different different locations okay this is important so sikkim's state bird is blood peasant a uh, state animal is red banda state tree is yun pat grans and flower is dendrobium nobile so this is the uh, these are the state icons these are the animal trees flowers of sikkim that you need to know from your exam point of view which edition of the surya kiran exercise is taking place in pittoragar so here the very first question that you should be asking yourself is that this exercise takes place between which countries so pittoragar is mentioned here definitely one party is india but which one is the next party the other party is nepal so this exercise is con is conducted between india and nepal and recently the 15th edition of this exercise has started in pittoragarh which is in uttarakhand do remember the venue guys it can also be asked from you uttarakhand pittoragarh uttarakhand okay so this is very simple this is the current news this is the static portion that is coming out of this current news that is the exercises that india conduct with the sarc nations okay so let's understand it with the map with maldives india conducts equivalent with sri lanka india has mitra shakti and slinex with bangladesh india conducts two most important exercises sampriti and bongo sagar there was another exercise as well which is known as in bin corpet now this corpet is not a designated dedicated military drill it is a coordinated patrol exercise so it is a patrolling exercise that india conducts with many countries okay so whenever your question or news is about the corpet the most important question that can come out of the corpet is the edition that india has conducted with a certain country or the location okay so this has not been conducted recently none of these have been con conducted recently except for the one with this nepal that is surya kiran now india does not conduct any military exercise either with pakistan or afghanistan nor it does conduct any exercise with bhutan as well because bhutan does not have its own army and navy or air force the security of bhutan is vested with india so india takes care of it therefore india does not conduct any exercise with bhutan but if we talk about the entire sarc the map of the sarc so these are the exercises that india conducts with its sarc neighbors 
So I hope that this map helps you in memorizing the exercises that India conducts with these SARC nations. Let me repeat it. So with Maldives, India conducts equivalent, which is an army exercise. Although Maldives is an island nation, still we do not conduct any naval exercise with Maldives. The exercise that we conduct with it is equivalent only. Then with Sri Lanka, you have Mitra Shakti, which is an army exercise. You have Slinex, Sri Lanka, India naval exercise. With Bangladesh, we have three major exercises. One is Sampriti, which is the army exercise. Then you have Bongo Sagar and in BN Corpet. Both of them are the naval exercises. No air force exercise is conducted by India with any of these countries. Okay, so air force exercise nahi ki gai hai India ke dwara kinhi bhi Sark nations ke saath. Okay, so here your static portion is also covered. Moving on to the next question, which state has recently launched? Government at your doorstep, a one day long initiative to resolve the grievances of citizens of the state. So similar kind of initiatives have been launched by a number of states now. Okay, so government at your doorstep uh, has also been launched by the West Bengal government and you have Madhya Pradesh as well. So similarly, many states are launching these initiatives. Now, what is the thing that distinguishes this initiative from the other? the other uh, initiatives that have been launched by the other states in India. The reason or the thing that distinguishes it from the other initiatives is that it is, first of all, it is a one day long campaign and secondly, it aims to resolve the grievances of the citizens and also spread awareness about the government initiatives. Okay, so these are the two major reasons for which this initiative have been, has been launched by the government of Goa. So the right answer is option B. Okay, so this I have already told you that this is a one day long campaign. Now, Goa's liberation day is observed on 19th December because in 1961 on this day only, Goa got its freedom from Portuguese. Goa statehood day is observed on 30th May. Now, these two days are important for you to know because Nowadays, we have already seen this thing in your NAVAD examination as well that the examiner is asking you basic questions as well like you have one question on Kalpana Chawla spacecraft. So this is how you have to prepare for your upcoming exams. RBI may also ask questions like these. If the news is about Goa, it can very well ask you a question about the Goa statehood day or the liberation day of Goa. Okay, so here these two days are mentioned. I hope that you can memorize them well. Dancing with Dreams is a collection of poems written by the Chief Secretary of which of the following states? Uttarakhand, Andhra Pradesh, West Bengal, Tripura and Meghalaya. The right answer is Andhra Pradesh CM, uh, sorry, Andhra Pradesh Chief Secretary Adityanath Das. So he has written the book, Dancing with Dreams, and he is the uh, person, he is Adityanath Das. Who is he? He is the CM of Andhra Pradesh, YS Jagan Mohan Reddy, and he is releasing this book, Dancing with Dreams. Guys, I am again saying that if you want the PDF of this PPT, then you have to join the Telegram group, and the link of the group is in description below. Moving on to the next question, who is the new CM of Punjab? So this is, I guess, many of you would know this question because uh, this has, some days have already passed since this news, but still it is important for us to know that who is the CM of Punjab, particularly for those who don't know about it. So who is the CM of Punjab? Punjab it is Charanjit Singh Channi, who is from Congress party, okay? Next thing that is of importance is the governor of Punjab, Banwari Lal Purohit. And remember guys, he has also been appointed as the governor very recently. Okay, so that makes both of these people very important because both of these appointments have taken place very recently. So he is Banwari Lal Purohit, the governor of Punjab and he is the newly elected or appointed CM of Punjab. 
so that was all for today i hope that you have enjoyed my session and if you have then do not forget to share it among your friend and also subscribe the channel